Welcome to the Dr. Gundry Podcast. Well, by now you probably heard all about the keto diet. Maybe you've heard it can help you lose weight, feel sharper, and more. Or maybe you've read those articles saying that it's actually dangerous. Well, my guest today wants to help you sort out fact from fiction, and I couldn't have asked for a better guide. He's Mark Sisson, founder of Primal Kitchen, former marathoner, best-selling author, and all-around impressive guy, and Mark is out with a brand new book called Keto for Life. And uh, it has my endorsement actually on the back of the book, and it's a great primer for anyone looking to try the keto diet. So on today's episode, Mark and I are gonna talk about weeding through decades of diet myths, some of our favorite subjects mm -hmm. together, the importance of adding fat to your diet, and whether long distance running is really good for you. So all of you runners, stay tuned, because we're gonna talk with one of the godfathers of running right here, Mark. Great to have you on Great the podcast. Great to see you again, Steve. The last time we saw each other was uh, Saint Jean Capfera. What a treat that was to come around the corner and see you and your wife. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. There we are. Uh, you're, you're going one way. I'm yep. going the other way. And we did a double take and yep. then stopped. You know, a couple feet apart. And we'd pass. Yeah, Mark, Steve. Yeah. Yep. yeah, there you go. So yeah, great to have you. So you and I have lived through the extremes of diet information, high carb, low fat, Atkins, and, and more. Um, in your case, what made you realize that you were doing everything wrong? Or maybe you never did anything wrong? You know, I didn't realize I was doing things wrong uh, for a long time. I was an uh, endurance athlete uh, starting out in the 70s, I actually started in the 60s, but competed well in the 70s uh, in marathons got injured doing that. Um, as I find out later, it was a result, partly a result of the highly inflammatory diet that I was using to fuel all those miles. Uh, transitioned to triathlon and did Ironman a couple of times. And then I got the message that, uh, you know, I didn't want to beat myself up that much to be fit anymore. Uh, I had to retire from competition. Um, throughout my life as an athlete, I'd always sought ways in which I could enhance my performance naturally, legally. Uh, and that meant uh, some sort of dietary information or manipulation, supplements if that was the case. So I was always a student of, uh, of the human body, of, of human physiology, of evolution, of, um, as, as time went on, of gene expression and how uh, genetic science really factors into a lot of what we're talking about today. Uh, and I started uh, simply understanding that fats weren't necessarily the bad guy that they were made out to be in the 70s, 80s, and, and, and 90s. Uh, so I started incorporating more fats into my diet, and as I stopped training or, or you know, cut way back on my training, and I didn't need that many calories, I was adding in a little bit more of the fat. Um, I, I was always eating uh, protein. I started to look at, at um, you know, the amount of sugar I was eating, and, and I thought, well, this, uh, this isn't necessary anymore because I'm not running the miles, I'm not burning the calories, I'm not filling the glycogen stores and all of this. Uh, and so I started to cut back on the sugar, and I noticed I felt better uh, from that. And so I went for another decade uh, writing books about training and writing books about optimizing your diet for training, uh, starting to write books for the general public about how to lose weight by using dietary manipulation. Uh, however, I still suffered my own set of maladies. I still had uh, irritable bowel syndrome that ran my life. I had arthritis in my uh, feet. I had osteoarthritis in my feet that I thought was partly a result of my running career and partly just a natural artifact of being older, but I couldn't grip a golf club and, and that was like weird to me. And uh, so I had the, the arthritis, I had tendonitis on a regular basis, I had all these itises and, uh, and it just wasn't, it just was, that wasn't right for a guy who was trying to be not just fit, but now healthy. Uh, and when and I was- And you're a world expert on health. And I'm a world expert on health and that's the, that was, and you see this a lot in our field. You see experts who still, you know, behind the curtain, they're suffering and they're, they've got all the maladies that they write about and talk about. So in my case, when I was 47, my wife- Last year. Yeah, really, it's going on 20 years ago, pal. <laughs> uh, when I was uh, 47, my wife said, look, you're writing about how, how bad grain is for you. 
because uh, I'd done a lot of research on, on gluten and gliadin and zine and corn and, and all of the other, um, you know, these anti-nutrients, these fold, tightly folded proteins. Um, and she said, you're writing about all this grain stuff. You still have grain in your diet. What's that about? I'm like, well, I'm defending my right to eat grain because I don't think that's the cause of anything that's going on with me. She said, well, why don't you give up grain for 30 days? Well, I gave up grain for 30 days and it absolutely transformed my life. It was the most amazing transformation. The arthritis in my feet went away. The irritable bowel, the irritable bowel syndrome that, again, was like running my life since the age of 14 went away. The GERD that I experienced, uh, uh, you know, weird places like sitting back in an in a, in a airplane seat or something like that in the wrong position, that went away. Um, I had hemorrhoids for a long, uh, much of my life, went away. Uh, you know, the sinus infections that would linger after a cold, the stuffed up head that would just wouldn't seem to, that went away. It was like, it was incredible, this transformation from having given up this one food group that, that I was told my whole life was an important part of a the healthy, cornerstone. The cornerstone of a healthy diet, six to 11 servings a day. Well, that was such an aha moment for me that I really shifted everything to looking at, um, okay, how, if, if, if I'm a guy who defended my right to eat grains in the face of all this evidence, how many millions, tens of millions of people are out there suffering the same sorts of things I am? They may not be celiac, they may not be, you know, gluten intolerant on, a, on a certain tests, but there's something about their cons consumption of grains that's probably interfering with their, uh, their enjoyment of life to the fullest extent. That became the impetus for my looking into uh, the evolution of the human diet and how our genes you know, uh, turn on or off in response to certain inputs that we give them. Um, many of these inputs have to do with food and the foods that we choose to consume. Uh, and it really kind of opened this amazing world of, of exploration that continues to this day. So initially, I started with creating the primal blueprint, and that was yep. sort of based on our ancestral patterns of not just how we ate, you know, plants and animals, uh, but avoiding toxic foods, um, you know, moving around a lot at a low level of activity, not marathon running or triathlons, lifting heavy things once in a while, sprinting once in a while, getting plenty of sleep, uh, using our brain, engaging in play, all these things that I felt were sort of universal uh, behaviors that we all not only would like to exhibit, but our, our genes expect of us. And if we don't give those inputs to our genes, our genes don't manifest. They don't rebuild, renew, regenerate, recreate us the way we'd like to be, to be rebuilt. So uh, started out with Primal, and that was when Paleo was getting on. I just, yeah. Primal was my own brand. And I got so dialed in with that, and I got so happy with my results, and I got and I had hundreds of thousands, millions of people who were following my blog, and, and, and reporting back about their incredible experiences, I thought, well, I could leave it at that, but you know, I'm, th maybe there's more. And that's when I started looking at uh, a ketogenic diet as what I would call next level stuff. You know, that's, that was what got me ultimately to experimenting with, um, now, which is the basis for Keto for Life, uh, developing what I call metabolic flexibility. So you can live your life without ever having to think about counting calories or portion control or meal time or any of that other stuff. I'm going to stop you and uh, I'm going to point out that why is it that your wife and my wife uh, are usually so intelligent and that if we would just listen to them uh, like you have and yeah. I, I certainly have, yeah. it's amazing. Oh, no, uh, it is. The kicking and screaming, by the way. I, lift, I listened to her kicking and screaming, but it was quite the eye-opener, yes. Yeah, and yeah. so, so I, I had to give a shout out to, sure. to wives, because yeah. uh, uh, everything good that happens, happens because of my wife. Yeah. Yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, so yeah, I mean, you really, and I called you a, a grandfather of the keto movement, but, you know, Mark Daly Apple, and, you know, the Primal Blueprint really, you know, kind of set the stage for yes. a lot of what, you know, we now do in the, ancestral movement mm -hmm. or paleo movement. So a lot of people are confused by all these names. Um, what, what's the difference between a paleo primal diet mm -hmm. and, and a keto primal diet? Right. So it's a, it's a, it becomes nuanced at this point. It's really um, all of these diets that, that tend to work mostly work because of the things you're not eating. Yeah. Okay, so when you eliminate the offending foods, when you eliminate 
um, the sugars, the sugary drinks, the pies, cakes, candies, cookies, sorry people, the, um, the breads, the pastas, the cereals, and you come down to this list of natural, real food, meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts, seeds, vegetables, a little bit of fruit, some, some starchy tubers, that's real food. That's what the body is, is equipped to handle. So paleo really looked at um, that cornucopia of foods as uh, basically as much as you want, as often as you want, because you're not eating the toxic frankenfoods that, that society has created for us. Um, Primal kind of looked at that and said, well, maybe there's some things that we can add, uh, because paleo tended to, to think in terms of like dairy being off limits, because until we started herding animals 10,000 years ago, our ancestors di didn't consume dairy. Um, we can go into a whole discussion about why I think dairy is appropriate under certain circumstances. But all these foods exist on the spectrum, too. I mean, any food that you talk about, I can, I can give you exceptionally great versions of those foods and horribly toxic versions of those foods. So when we talk about dairy, for instance, you know, 2% skim, homogenized, pasteurized, forget it. It's nasty stuff. Um, it's uh, A1 casein, which is a completely different casein from uh, which most of us uh, evolve to uh, digest easily. Uh, on the other hand, you've got, a, you've got ghee and butter and, and, and artisanal cheeses, and I think they're great. Uh, raw milk, uh, if you can get it, um, for some people, it's, it's great. So dairy became one of those little touch points where paleo said, we're not going to do dairy. And I said, primal, I said, look, if you're not lactose intolerant, then I think dairy's fine. Um, a little bit of chocolate once in a while, a little bit of red wine. I mean, I wanted to be as inclusive as possible with the Primal Blueprint. I wanted to create a, a list of foods that people didn't feel like they were giving up, they were, that they were sacrificing in large quantities all the foods, all the comfort foods that they'd, they'd eaten over time. Now, as paleo and then primal sort of became more mainstream, we start talking about keto. And what is keto? Keto, uh, the ketogenic diet, uh, and it's... It's a little bit of an elaborate discussion here, but um, the body runs on uh, fats and, and, and carbohydrates mostly. And uh, the three macronutrients that we talk about are fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Well, proteins are largely structural, so we want to consume protein just to rebuild our bodies. But fats and carbohydrates have been sort of the fuel that we've used. Um, we were born with this amazing default setting that would allow us to derive most of our energy from fat, from stored body fat. Uh, in the absence of food or fuel, historically over millions of years, which was generally the case for most people, you didn't have three square meals a day, you'd go, you'd miss meals, you'd miss days, you'd go days without eating, and you had to maintain energy and you had to maintain, maintain muscle mass. The body evolved in an incredible system to take some of the stored body fat, combust that as fuel in the muscles, take other parts of that fat, send it to the liver, and make another fuel that we call ketones. Most people don't even know about the existence of ketones, but ketones are, as I say, we're, we're born with this amazing ability to create these ketones. Um, the liver, under the right circumstances, the liver can make 750 calories a day worth of this fuel, worth of ketones. So the idea behind the ketogenic diet was uh, let's get away from this dependency on carbohydrates. Let's get away from this having to eat carbohydrates every couple of hours and have our blood sugar go up because the carbs convert to glucose and that causes insulin and then an insulin takes the glucose out of the bloodstream because it wants to get rid of it and our blood sugar drops and we get hungry again and we have to eat more carbs and you go on this roller coaster all day long. And I, when I say all day long, I'm talking for decades. Most people start with the first meal, their parent, the first solid food their parents give them is carbohydrate based. So we, we, we lose this ability to burn fat, we lose this ability to, uh, to make ketones and use ketones efficiently, we become carbohydrate dependent for most of our lives. So the ketogenic diet, and, and, and what we call keto in general, is a way of training your body to get back to this, this um, flexibility, this metabolic flexibility where the body can extract energy not just from carbohydrates, which most people do, but from fat on your plate of food, the fat on your hips and thighs and belly, the carbohydrate on your plate of food, the glucose in your bloodstream, the glycogen in your muscles, the ketones that your liver's making, and you become metabolically flexible to the extent that you don't 
uh, you, you don't really ever run out of energy because you always have an energy source. Your body knows how to take, if there's no food immediately available, the body just goes, hmm, I think I'll take it off my thighs and combust it in the muscles. I'll send some to the liver. I'll send the ketones that are made there to fuel the brain. We won't need carbohydrates. We'll go as long as you want. A couple meals, a couple days. We don't care. We got this handled. So the body, we train the body to become metabolically flexible this way. The other thing, and I think the most... Uh, important aspect of this is that hunger, appetite, and cravings dissipate or go away in many, in many cases. So where most people who are carbohydrate dependent are living one meal to the next, like, okay, we just had breakfast, what time's lunch? And uh, we get I better back, have a snack before lunch. <laughs> Got to have a snack, a mid-morning, a coffee break in the morning, you know, or a pick-me-up because I'm going to feel like taking a nap at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon if I don't have a, a bagel or an energy bar, that's the latest one. You know, and then go home and have dinner and, and then maybe have a snack watching TV. This is um, not only uh, antithetical to health, uh, it's also a pattern that, that the like most people in this country engage in. We eat just way too much food. And the problem is it's driven by hunger. It, you know, people actually feel hunger because it's a hormonal dysregulation that they're causing by their choices of food. And so if I can... In, you know, it, it, uh, educate and instruct people on other choices of food that would have a different effect and would, and would cause their bodies to, to upregulate enzyme systems that take fat out of storage and combust it, that would upregulate enzyme systems that um, help in the conversion uh, of uh, other fats into ketones to use as fuel, that would uh, improve what we call mitochondrial biogenesis, actually increase the number of power plants in the cell where the fat burns, improve the efficiency of those power plants, of those mitochondria, uh, you literally repattern, reprogram your body to become fat adapted and keto adapted. Uh, and it is such a sense of freedom for everybody who does this. Wow. So how does somebody sign up for this? <laughs> you sign up. Um, they, you go to the store and yeah, you buy uh, yeah, well, Primal Kitchen Mayo. Well, that's... So, well, I'm doing this yeah, for a purpose. Yeah. Um, this is fat. Yes. This is, I mean... 100% fat. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it's basically yeah. fat. Yeah. And you're telling me that one of the ways to get this... Yes. ...is you should eat fat. Yes. But fat makes you fat. Come on, Mark. Look, um, look, at, look at you, you, God you bless, slob. God yeah. bless Susan Powder. Remember her? <laughs> I do. Fat makes you fat. <laughs> I'm like, all right. Um, I bought into that too, by yeah. the way, and I know oh, you yeah. did as well. I did. It made sense, right? It made sense. Um, fat doesn't make you fat, and, and in fact, uh, in order to burn fat, you have to provide some, typically some form of fat to um, uh, stoke the fire. Uh, so it's really the absence of carbohydrate that prompts the body to go into this ketogenic state. This, and by ketogenic, we mean the genesis of ketones. We're making ketones. Um, because typically, we don't make ketones if we're living on a carbohydrate-based carb dependency uh, state most of the time. There's no need to. The body says, I got plenty of fuel. Uh, I've got this uh, glucose in the bloodstream. You're I know you're going to eat every two hours. That's cool. Uh, even every four hours. Um, you know, the, the, the brain is happy with the glucose. Um, insulin, which is higher because of all the carbohydrates, you're, insulin locks fat into the fat cells, so you can't combust that fat. So yep. you, you just become, uh, you, and over time, excess calories then get converted to stored body fat, which historically is awesome. Imagine, you know, two, a million years ago or 500,000 years ago, whatever, you come across some food and you go, okay, I finally find some food after a couple of days. And you don't just eat till, you know, you're done. You keep eating. Your brain is wired to overeat that food. And we evolved the system, and it's so elegant, a system that takes the extra calories from that food that we overate and converts them into energy that we, instead of carrying five gallon buckets around with us all through the woods and everything, we store this on our hips, on our butt, on our thighs, right around the center of gravity so that we can carry it with us and have access to the fuel whenever we run out of fuel. It's a beautiful system. It's a beautiful system as long as you also have the ability to take that fuel out of storage and burn it. And that's what most people have lost. So in order to, in order to get there, you have to withhold carbohydrates. You have to say, okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut back on my intake of sugars and sweets and sweetened beverages and pies, cakes, candies, cookies. 
And, and this doesn't mean you have to, like, vegetables are basically free on, on a keto diet. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice. I tell people when you start keto, do not let yourself go hungry. The first three weeks, you're just going to train your body to burn fat. I don't care what happens. I don't care if you don't lose weight. I can pretty much guarantee you won't gain weight. But I don't care if you don't lose weight that first three weeks. I want your body to adapt to this knowledge that there are not going to be that many carbohydrates available. It's going to be um, a, a different uh, situation uh, in terms of the environment. And, and as a result, and it doesn't happen in a day or a meal or a day or whatever, but over a couple of days, a couple of weeks, the body says, oh, that's what's going on. So I'm going to upregulate. Um, I'm going to start building more of these mitochondria. Um, I'm going to, the brain starts to understand how to use ketones better and more efficiently. The liver starts pumping ketones out. Um, and everything's running quite smoothly. And at that point, about three weeks in, when I say you're fat and keto adapted, and that's three weeks of having restricted carbs to say 50 or fewer grams a day. We could talk about what that looks like. And you're basically there. And, and from, from that point on, it's really how, how closely can you adhere to a program that's within reason. I'm not saying you have to eat 50 grams of carbs the rest of your life. In fact, what I strive for with metabolic flexibility is what I call the keto zone. Once you've done the work, once you've built the metabolic machinery, once you've become metabolically flexible, then I can have a day where I eat nothing, feel fine. I can have a day where I eat a lunch and a dinner, feel fine. I can have a day where I eat 175 or 200 grams of carbs and feel fine. What's the difference? There's no difference. I feel fine. That's all that matters. All that matters is I'm able to go about my life without any conscious knowledge that, oh my God, I screwed things up because I was supposed to be keto and then I wasn't and I felt like crap. If you feel like crap after that, you're not keto adapted. So um, give me an idea. Most Americans are not keto adapted. They don't have metabolic flexibility. Right. They can't turn from sugar burning to fat burning. And people hear about the, um, the keto flu or the Adkins flu. How do you get people through that transition phase? So there are a number of um, ways to do that. Uh, in my uh, previous book, uh, The Keto Reset Diet, yep. um, we talked about a six-week um, induction phase, if you will, six weeks of transitioning, stair-stepping, to um, mostly a primal, uh, primal blueprint type diet which is just basically cutting out breads and pastas and cereals. But, but you could still have starchy tubers. You could still have um, uh, you know, peas and beans and, and, and things like that that were natural, um, but would still keep you at around 100, 120 grams of carbs a day. And that just gets your body used to having fewer carbs. Most people eat three, four, five hundred grams of carbs a day. No, come on. I'm telling you, you know. You absolutely <laughs> know that. Um, it's, it's, it's scary how much... Uh, the, the world depends on carbohydrate. So when you, um, but if you eliminate all the toxic foods and you come down to this list of, of um, you know, healthful foods that are all natural, that are on the perimeter of, of you know, the, the store, you can pretty much eat what you want. So my first rule of thumb, as I say, don't let yourself go hungry. This is not about you struggling and suffering to get to a certain point. This is about you with grace and ease, transitioning your body to a point where it's, first of all, okay with not eating a lot of sugar and not eating every couple of hours. And then once you get to that point, then all you gotta do is find 50 or 60 grams of carbs per day that you cut from that. And then the transition becomes quite easy. Then it's, there's, there's really no keto flu. A lot of people who claim to get a keto flu, and this is a, this is a sense of like a little bit of malaise, a little bit of dizziness, a little bit of, of uh, lightheadedness, because the brain hasn't yet gotten used to the lowered glucose and hasn't really gotten the message that it's fine to be burning ketones all the time. Uh, the brain actually thrives more on ketones than it does uh, on glucose. Um, but that transition takes a while. A any of these uh, things that we do to the human body, uh, you know, e evolution created a, this amazing system, as I said, and one of the aspects of the system is, it, is that it, it, it likes the status quo until you prove to it that the status quo is no longer going to be. So if, if you do thing a meal one, for one meal or two meals, the body goes, nah, I'm, I'm resisting that because that's not enough time for me to even think about changing. Because if I'm going to use resources, if this body is going to use resources to build more enzyme systems, to make more mitochondria, 
um, to increase bone density, to increase muscle. Those all are expensive uh, resource using things. You gotta, you gotta figure out how to trick the body into doing that by giving the genetic signals that cause genes that, to turn on that, that build muscle, to cause the genes that turn on that make mitochondria or that make uh, bones stronger or that uh, support the immune system. All of these are well within our control as humans based largely on choices we make with the foods that we choose to eat, how much sleep we get, how well we control stress, the types of exercise we choose to do. You know, you choose to do one type of exercise, you become long and skinny and, and gaunt. You, tr you choose to do another type of exercise, you become, you know, larger and, and more muscular and, and, and stronger. So um, my, my life's work has been really about identifying these hidden genetic switches that we all have and, and exposing them to people and saying, here's, here's something you might try if this is your goal. Cool. You mentioned this already, but I want to get back to this. Should you, your book is Keto for Life. Should I always be in ketosis? So that's kind of a <laughs> bait and switch, I guess, um, because, um, well, it, it, and it's also, you've worked with publishers, and so you come up with a, <laughs> well, you come up with a title, and, and you like your title, and they like yours, and you wind up putting them together. This is, this is a longevity book, so this is, yeah. this, is a, this is a book about how to live a longer, happier, healthier, more productive, loving life. Uh, and so Keto for Life was, and because keto was my last book, they needed the transition, it's, it's great. Um, but what, what I'm talking about, and when I talk about keto, and here's a good, a, a good segue to make that distinction. So keto is a way of, of eating, a way of living, that embodies this low carb um, methodology. But it doesn't just require or involve or necessitate low carb. You can go keto just by not eating. So if you, uh, if you don't eat for three days, um, you're in ketosis. Uh, you prompt the body to, to create these ketones. Now it's a lot easier if you don't eat th for three days, if you become keto adapted. If you are a sugar burner and you don't eat for three days, you know, that's where you have the visions. That's where you see Elvis and Jesus, and I mean, you see the whole, <laughs> the whole thing, right? So, <laughs> and the crash and burn. <laughs> the crash and burn, that's the crash and burn. So uh, to ease your way into this, this keto way of, of eating has as much to do with um, how often you eat, uh, the choices that you make when you eat, um, the fractal nature of eating. So as I talk a lot about uh, in, in the book, and, I, and I've talked a lot on podcasts, I don't know if you know a guy named Art Devaney? Oh yeah, yeah. Sure. So, so Art, you know, he's always been ahead of the curve on everything. And, and one of the things he started 10 years ago was this, he just says, I eat fractally. Some days I eat a meal, some days I don't eat, some days I eat three meals, some days a big meal and a small meal, and, and he changes it up because that's the human experience. Historically, humans didn't have three portion controlled meals a day plus two snacks, you know, plus a, a bedtime uh, pick me up or whatever. So um, keto for life is really about adopting this way, this, this keto eating strategy that allows you to maintain metabolic flexibility, whether you go off keto for a couple of days and say, I'm going to have, uh, you know, I'm going on vacation, I'm going to have pasta, you know, and I'll suffer the consequences. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, like I, I went to, you know, I moved to Miami and, and uh, my wife and I found this restaurant and, um, you know, I hadn't had pasta for, seriously, for 15 years. And, and we found a pasta dish that's got this amazing, you know, truffle Alfredo sauce Ooh, and it was yeah. gluten-free pasta. And we like, you know, so once a week we would go there and order salmon and, and the pasta and split both and, and that would be our meal. Look, I love to eat. I love food. I want every bite of food I put in my mouth to taste great. So I've, I'm not advocating for sacrifice and discipline and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm advocating for mindful eating and ultimately arriving at a place where you are so intuitively tuned into your own body that you don't need to think about it. You will go, you know, I'm, I could eat the whole cheesecake, but you know, that, I know that's not going to serve me, so I'll have a bite. That'll serve me. Um, you know, I, I, can, uh, I can go without eating this next meal uh, because I don't have time to eat and I've got th some things to do, and I'm confident that my body will have zero negative consequences from that. And I won't be hangry and I won't think about not eating. I'll just, it's such, as I say, it's such a, um, uh, a level of freedom 
that most people never get to experience. When you think about how much of your life is tied to eating and regular meal times and being hungry and feeding the hunger, um, in most, most cases, unnecessarily, like you're not really hungry. You're just like your mouth is watering because it's 1230 and it's lunchtime. That, you know, you bring up a good point. So many people become hangry yeah. when they start a diet. Yeah. Um, that's the low blood sugar. Yeah. So that's not having become fat adapted yet. And that's why diets don't work if you just count calories. If you're, if you're just saying, well, I'm going to, this keto sounds good, but I don't think I could go without eating carbs. I think I'll just count calories. Um, the discipline works as long as it does, and then it stops. And, and most people who are uh, carb-centric eaters who start to cut back on all their calories, um, they get hungry, they get hangry. Uh, now they're fighting it the whole way. Um, typically, uh, they have this um, entirely different physiology that when they don't eat, instead of the body just going, hey, I got this, I'm gonna burn fat, I'm gonna make ketones, it's all gonna be great, love what you're doing. Um, the body goes, wait a minute, I'm used to carbohydrates, what's going on? The brain starts to get panicky, sends signals to the liver, the, I mean to the um, adrenals. The adrenals secrete cortisol. Cortisol then goes out and, and literally tears down muscle tissue to find a couple of amino acids it can send to the liver to become glucose. And it becomes a very destructive process. And that's the experience that most people had dieting in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And when you used to watch The Biggest Loser, well, I don't, you didn't watch it, but... Um, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you see these people lose 200 pounds in a season, 150, 160, 200 pounds. Then you hear about them three years later, they're back to where they were before and, and, and bigger. Worse. And yeah. bigger. Yeah. Because they, they lost muscle mass, and uh, their metabolisms got all screwed up, and now it took fewer calories to, to fill them, and yet they still had the hunger thing. And it's horrible. So. The, the, the keto lifestyle really sort of fixes all that and, and does so without necessitating that you be ketogenic your whole, your whole life. You know, the term ketosis is an interesting term because osis means an excess of something. Mm -hmm. So ketosis basically means you have an excess of ketones in the bloodstream. Well, when you first start eating this way, the liver's like, I can do this, and the liver starts pumping out ketones and because you haven't built the metabolic machinery to burn them, uh, you, you, you can take a blood test and you go, oh my gosh, I'm four millimolar, I'm six millimolar. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in ketosis. Well, that doesn't mean anything to me that you're in ketosis. I mean, that's, you're making ketones, but if you're not using them, you're not, get, you're not getting the benefits of this lifestyle. So you have to build a metabolic machinery and there's, t it, takes, it, it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of, there's an area where you, you have to be disciplined about it. Um, but, and there's certain workouts that you can do that will enhance the effect uh, uh, more quickly. But there's a point at which uh, you become uh, so keto adapted that the liver, which started out going frantically pumping out ketones, um, and you'd pee them out and that's why you show purple on these pee strips and you yeah. breathe them out and that's why your friends would stay away. And um, now the liver's going, um, see, I know what you're doing here. You're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna fool me. I want to save. I want to conserve energy because that's a human. That's a human experience. It's, is to not use resources, waste resources, um, and and the body recognizes that once you get keto adapted and fat adapted, um, most of the work you do throughout the day can be fueled by fat. So your muscles are now they're not burning glycogen and they're not, a little bit, but they're not. Yeah. They're mostly burning fat, and you can do. 85, 90, 92 percent of all your work just burning fat, and that's a beautiful thing. So now you're, as you're just walking around the day, or you're doing, you know, minor tasks, and even going to the gym, you're mostly burning fat. Now the brain uh, doesn't burn fat. The brain is using the ketones. So you got the muscles using the fat. The brain's using the ketones. Um, you don't need glucose very much at all. A little bit for red blood cells and a few other things, but your body actually makes glucose. It's, it's, again, it's so elegant, Steve. So you got the triglyceride, the, the, the three fatty acids get combusted. Um, the glycerol becomes part of a, a mechanism that makes glucose. Right. It's, it's so elegant, it's almost like a, a closed loop. So um, your liver just goes, oh, I see what you're doing. When you go to the gym and you do all this work, your legs, you might do a leg day and your legs require 
30 times as much energy to go through that work. While you're doing your legs, how much energy does your brain require? Same as usual. Same as usual. So the brain just goes like this all day long, right? And, and if all you're doing is supplying ketones for the brain, the liver gets it and the liver goes, I'm just gonna pump out enough ketones for the brain. I don't need to waste these resources and pee them out or, or you know, ex exhale them or sweat them out. And so what you find is that people who have been in a keto lifestyle for a long time don't even register as in ketosis on these monitors because they're so well adapted, the body's just got it dialed in. It's, it's, a, it's such a, a beautiful thing, this, this body that we have. That's great information because I have a, a number of patients, and as you know, in, in all my books, I have a, a chapter of the, the keto plant paradox system. And a ton of my patients uh, will come in and say, I'm in ketosis and you know, my, my strips say I'm in ketosis or my breath machine or my blood says I'm really in ketosis, I'm in huge ketosis yeah, yeah. and I haven't lost an ounce. Uh, this doesn't work. Yeah. And I think your explanation is incredibly good. Um, yeah. That just because you're pumping out all these ketones doesn't mean you're actually using them. No, and in some cases, uh, people will use the sort of the the dirty keto or the shortcuts, and they'll say, okay, M I heard MCT oil is a, is, a, is a great substrate to make ketones. So they, they drink MCT oil. It's, you drink too much and you, and you have some digestive upset. But, That's um, true. Or ketone salts. And because they think what they're doing is they're chasing the ketones. And you gotta chase the results. You, you don't, it, I don't care about the ketones. I want the results. And the fact that I know what's going on below the surface, I know that you're making ketones, um, that's all I, that I care about. So if you show me that you're in ketosis, that's great. I think that's an awesome uh, first path for you in the first couple of steps. But do the work, do the you know work out in the gym, and and then what you will find, and I bet this is happening with with your patients. Um, we don't need to eat nearly as many calories as we think we do. Um, I I amaze and almost scare myself on how few calories I eat some days, and. I'm still carrying a little bit of you know mass here, um, you know muscle mass, and uh, it's it's amazing to think that this system that we evolved can become a closed loop. If you think about it this way, all right, you don't eat for say you don't eat for three days. What happens? The body goes well. Um, if you're keto adapted, which you already are, if you're an ancestral human or keto now, okay, the body will take fat out of fat stores, and you know I'm. 10% body fat, and I have enough fat on me to, to walk 300 miles without... Yeah, it lasts a long time. Lasts a long time. So the body takes the fat out of, out of fat cells, and it uses it for daily, you know, for daily movement and getting around. It sends uh, some of that fat to the liver to become ketones. And as I said, the liver can make up to 750 ke uh, calories worth of ketones a day. It takes some of the glycerol uh, from the tri uh, triglyceride molecules, uses that as a substrate to make... Um, the whatever little glucose for 40 grams a day or something like that that it needs. And then an, a whole new set of variables enters, and I think this is amazing. There's, a, there's a, a genetic response, an epigenetic response to these changes that causes uh, protein to be spared. So whereas on a normal day we probably eat too much protein, and certainly from one meal to the next, if we eat too much protein, it's easy, we just deaminate it and pee it out, but now the body tends to spare protein. And if you're not burning protein, because you're not supposed to combust protein, protein's supposed to be for structural um, repair. You know, yeah. repair, then you've got this system that is burning fat, creating ketones, a little bit of glucose, uh, sparing protein. And so when you see people who do, who've been good at this, will fast for five days and, and not lose much in the way of muscle mass a pound, pound and a half, which they get back because most of that is glycogen and, yeah. and water. Um, and they're burning off fat, and I suspect most of the fat they're burning off is visceral fat, which is another a major reason to do uh, fasts once you get keto adapted and get metabolically flexible. Um, but this closed loop is so cool because if you think, of, well, how many calories do I need to get by in a day? And you probably don't need that many. If your liver's cranking out five, six hundred enough for the brain and, and your um, and your body is com combusting fat for energy and you're sparing protein, um, 
you probably didn't need that many calories to get through a day in the first place. It might be 1,200, 1,100, 1,200 calories for some people. Some people thought, up until now, they did the, the, the math online, and, oh, I can have 1,875 calories a day. Well, you can, and you make, maybe you can get away with it, but that doesn't mean it's good for you. I want to take a little bit of a diversion here and say, most people tend to see what they can get away with. So most people in life are like, and it's human nature, and I'm not, I do it, it's, I'm not judging, um, but you know, like, oh, how little work can I do at work and still get paid and not get fired, right? And, and you know, uh, how, how easy can I do this workout and not get caught by my trainer or whatever? But, <laughs> but one of those things is how much food can I eat and not gain weight? What's the biggest amount of this meal I can eat and not feel like a pig? What's the biggest piece of cheesecake I can have? And, and not feel guilty about having had that. Uh, and so we tend to ask permission, like, okay, they filled my plate up, that must be a serving, it must be okay. Uh, or they gave me a, uh, you know, a Cheesecake Factory gave me a slice this big, they call that one serving, so as long as I don't have two servings, I'm good to go. Um, meanwhile, you're, you know, your granny might have made you a cheesecake and she cut you a little slice like that, well, that's what granny thinks is a serving. So the idea really is like, People will say, well, how much of this can I eat and what can I get away with? I, a couple of years ago, I just thought, you know, that's a, that's a strange way of looking at it. I go to the gym and I see people on a treadmill, 45 minutes, 50 minutes on the treadmill. Why are you running so much? Oh, because I love to eat. Wait a minute. You're doing all this work, struggling and suffering and sweating and groaning just so you can have a few more bites of something you probably shouldn't have in the first place? Like that is so, do you realize how just bizarre that is? And yet people do that. I, I, I exercise because I love to eat. I so, drank eight Diet Cokes a day so yeah. I could have more to eat. I mean, no, perfect example. A perfect example. You, you, you carry this, you audit your, your day, you know, and you carry this little tally pad with you. Okay, I can have this tonight because I didn't have that for lunch. And it's crazy. So um, I thought it's, at one point I said, you know, let's, let's flip this on, its, on edge and say, what's the least amount of food I can eat? Maintain muscle mass. Uh, maintain energy, not get sick, not get cold, and most importantly, not be hungry, because hunger ruins everything. Hunger, hunger is the great destroyer of any of these programs. So I started looking at what's, what was the least amount of food I could have, and, it's, a, and it's, a, it's like half of what I used to think I needed yeah, it's to, not much. to get by in a day. It's not much. And I th so I think when people are consistently, um, you know, pe some people use keto as an excuse to eat more food because they're eating a lot of fat, right? And I think, well, I'm, because I'm, I'm glad keto. you said that. Yeah. Um, how often do you think that is happening in the in the keto movement? I think less so now because it got called out a bunch of uh, a bunch maybe a year or two ago. Um, I was one of the people calling it out, but um, it you can't you can't hide behind that. Some of the early studies on keto diets, ketogenic diets, would show that you could eat 4,500 calories a day and not gain weight. And you, well, why, how could that be? Well, how that is, is if you're eating mostly fat, a little bit of protein and no carb, you don't create any insulin. And right. insulin is a, is a nutrient storage hormone. So you're not storing fat. Um, your body's figuring out a way to combust it by thermo, thermogenesis and a number of other probably um, unhealthy ways in which to dispose of this excess energy. But because you're not creating insulin, you can't, you can't really store it. I mean, protein is a... Um, does have an effect on insulin, but, but yeah, high fat, really high fat, like 90% fat, you know, 10% or 15% um, uh, protein, protein diets. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but that was interesting because, because people read that study and thought, well, I, okay, I can eat 4,500 calories a day and not gain weight. But you're not going to lose weight because the idea behind losing weight is you want to lose fat. You want to burn fat. You want to combust the stored body fat. And so uh, when you get good at, when you get keto adapted and, and you're in that keto, what I call the keto zone and metabolically flexible, then you can play around with eating smaller, smaller, smaller quantities of food. And that's really when you're, like every time you think you need 500 calories to get through the next uh, six hours, you think, well, I could eat a meal or I could take it off my butt or my thighs. And, and my body won't know, won't care, won't, won't uh, you know, have any negative consequences either way. So I may as well choose not to eat this meal and, um, and, and lose that and burn, combust that body fat. But Mark, aren't you going to get hungry? 
as I said, the, it's, it's so crazy what happens to your appetite when you develop this metabolic flexibility. Uh, the reason you have an appetite for the most part is this, these, you know, leptin and ghrelin balance and, and insulins involved there and glucagon and there's these hormones in the body that are sort of trying to keep you homeostasis. Um, and we screw, we screw it up and throw it off with this high carb diet. Once you get, uh, you eliminate the carbs and you get to the point where you're eating quality fats and quality proteins and a little bit of vegetables and, uh, well, or a fair amount of vegetables for that matter. Um, you, you get to the point where the body always has energy. Like the first thing that happens with, with people who go keto is they, they, they sort of like, they can't eat three meals a day because it's just too much food. Uh, so most people wake up in the morning and I, I promote this. I say, well, just see how, once you're keto adapted, see how long you can go without being hungry in the morning. And most people within a couple of days go, well, I made it to noon, no problem. Um, I have a cup of coffee myself at uh, seven o'clock in the morning and then I don't eat till 1.30. Um, some days I don't eat lunch. Uh, and, it's, and I work out in the morning. I work out fasted. I don't eat after the workout. I don't feel compelled to. Um, I, I recognize that there's, a, uh, there's an effect of working out fasted and then not eating afterwards that causes the body to release a pulse of growth hormone and testosterone. Um, and if you eat a post-workout meal right after, say, doing a heavy leg session or a heavy training session, uh, if it's a high-carb meal, then the insulin in that meal will blunt the, the growth hormone uh, and the testosterone yeah. spike. Yeah. Um, and that's what I used to do my whole life was I would, you know, again, back in the 80s and 90s, the mantra was uh, eat a, a post-workout meal that was 10% or 20% protein, four to one uh, pro, um, carbohydrate Carb to protein. protein yeah. And you'd, you'd take advantage of the glycogen resynthesis window, which, your body makes glycogen anyway, even when you don't eat any carbohydrate at all. All this does is speed it up. And why do you want to speed it up? Well, theoretically, in the old days, you want to speed it up because I'm going to go run 15 miles again tomorrow and the next day and the next day, which is, as we know, ludicrous. Since you brought that up, <laughs> um, many of our listeners don't know this, but yeah. you were an incredibly accomplished endur endurance athlete. Uh, I mean, incredibly, don't be modest. You had a lot of serious health problems. Yep. Can, can you talk about that for a moment? Well, so, um, the, as I said, the, the, when I was a runner um, exclusively, I ran 100 miles a week on average. Some weeks I ran 120, and some weeks I only ran 80 uh, for years at a time. Uh, and that's when I developed osteoarthritis in my feet, which I presumed was a result of um, all the miles. Uh, that's when I had um, the worst of my IBS, my irritable bowel syndrome. Um, uh, that's when I had the itises. And in fact, it wasn't even the, the um, arthritis in my feet that, caught, that prompted me to quit becoming an elite marathoner. Uh, it was tendonitis in my hips um, that just would not resolve. Uh, and that's really, um, I think, as I look back on it, it's the diet, the highly inflammatory diet uh, certainly not helped by, by the pounding um, uh, you know, of 100 plus miles a week on a body that was probably only designed to do 50 or 60 miles a week. Uh, so those were um, very frustrating times for me because I, I finished fifth in the U.S. National Championship in the marathon in 1980, uh, qualified for the Olympic trials. Uh, of course, 1980 was uh, the year that we didn't send a team to the Olympics. Um, and, uh, and then I, uh, two years later, I finished fourth at Ironman in Hawaii. Um, and, uh, you know, so I had, I had a certain level of, uh, of expertise and prowess at endurance competition. And later on, I set, uh, do you know the Versa Climber, that, that thing oh, yeah, in the gym? Yeah. Um, I set the world record for the mile climb in that, 5,280 feet, 22 minutes and 40 seconds. And I, I, st I don't think it's been broken since. I, yeah. yeah, so um, anyway, so I was, chasing, you know, uh, performance my whole life. Uh, and thwarted, uh, it turns, it seems at every turn, by my, um, my diet, uh, which I only discovered after I'd long since retired. Uh, people would say, well, if, if you had to do over again, would you, would you go back and change your diet? And I'd say, no, because actually, um, the way I got to where I am now uh, was so profound, 
I probably wouldn't have appreciated it if I'd started out that way. So. Well, suppose you had a perfect day. You know, I wrote in my last book about the dangers of marathons and mm -hmm. long dis distance training. Uh, got an opinion? Looking yeah, I mean, back. I wrote a book a couple years ago called Primal Endurance. Um, and it was basically my capitulation. It was my, I had enough friends who said, I don't care what you say, Mark. Uh, you had, you ran marathons, you enjoyed it, you got a lot out of it. I want to run a marathon, damn it. How do I do it? And I'm like, all right, if you're going to run a marathon, I'll show you how to do it uh, with the least amount of pain, suffering, sacrifice, and so on. Uh, and, and so I would certainly uh, train what we call train low, race high. I would train low carb. Um, I would race uh, with my carb tanks uh, more full. Um, I would uh, make my long, slow runs longer and slower and I would make my short, fast runs shorter and faster. Uh, I would do much more uh, strength training in the gym. I'd develop uh, uh, what we call maximum sustained power over time. So I'd be much more methodical about, about breaking the component parts of uh, competition down into their essential elements. When you're an endurance athlete, particularly a runner, you just run. Uh, and, and typically, and the, the reason I talk about making my longer runs longer and slower um, is we, we talk about um, this um, maximum aerobic function that we have. And uh, so we use the number 180 minus your age. So if you train at 180 minus your age, the lab results across thousands of people have shown that that's the heart rate at which, uh, below which you're using mostly fat. So you're using a lot of oxygen and mostly fat. Above that heart rate, um, you're starting to burn more glycogen and you're tapping into glycogen stores. Now, why is that important? Well, if you want to run long distance, you want to get as much energy from fat as possible. You don't want to tap in your glycogen stores. Um, but people will come back to me and say, well, wait a minute, if I, if I train at um, 180 minus my age and I'm, you know, I'm 30 years old or whatever and I'm training at 150, Mark, I can race at 165 or 170. I can train all day at 170, 175. Uh, and I'm, I'm going so slow at 150. And my answer is, well, okay, you're going slow because you suck at burning fat. You're good at burning sugar. I was great at burning sugar. I mean, I was, you know, I ran how I ran, burning, but burning mostly sugar. But I also did a number on my heart from having done that. I ran in what we call the no man's land for the longest time, a bla the black hole of training, where you're not going slow enough to improve aerobic capacity, and you're not going fast enough to improve anaerobic threshold. You're just beating yourself up. You're practicing hurting, literally. And that's what so many runners do in this black hole of training at, you know, heart rate of one, of, of like 80 to 87, 90% of their, of their max. And they spend 50% of their time training in that black hole with no appreciable benefits. And that's why I see these guys like, well, how many marathons did you do this year? I did eight marathons this year. Oh, really? What, you know, what, well, I did 340, 342, 345, 346, and 340. Okay, well, that, you, like, you're doing that much work. You should really improve. But they're just practicing to run that same speed the whole time. So there's a way to do it. But, and, I, and this is what I tell people, Steve, I, is I say, all right, if you want to run a marathon, I'll let you run two. You run one to finish, that's great. That's a belt buckle thing. That's a life a bucket list thing. If you really liked bumper. it, if you really <laughs> liked it, I'll let you run one more to see how fast you can go. And if you haven't broken three hours as a man, you're not a runner, find another sport. That's, that's pretty much the way I look at it. All right, good advice hate from to, the hate, guy who Hate to who piss who anybody off there who's an avid marathoner, but. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, your book is not just about eating. Um, it's, it's an amazing exercise program. What should your, our listeners who want to get more exercise, but you don't want to go do a marathon, you got, give me a couple things they can do I mean, do walking today. is still the best thing anybody can do. Like, you know, I, I saw you and your wife, and we were out doing a hike around saint jean cap -Ferrat. I don't know if you did the whole... Oh, both, yeah, we do the whole crazy that, thing. ...that thing, because we, we rarely do that small cap where we saw you. Um, but walking is spectacular. It's, it's, what, it's, it's the most human of all activities. We're bipedal. By the way, how do we not fall over every... It's like we're like a segue, that, you know, how we maintain this upright position. Uh, walking, uh, of course, you know, swimming and, and uh, easy... 
uh, cycling, uh, with an occasional uh, hard session thrown in. But if all you ever do is walk, you're 80% of where you need, need to be. And I'm talking, you know, walking an appreciable amount, walking 30, to 30 minutes to an hour a day on average. So some days it can be an hour and a half and some days nothing. But that's really the best. And, then I, and I think two days in the week, uh, two days in the gym per week is, is all you need in terms of lifting weights. Any more than that, um, and you're kind of, you're either not doing it hard enough when you're doing it, um, or you're, you're not going to the gym for the right reasons. You're just going to chat it up and see people. <laughs> Which a lot of people do, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. All right. Um, you do recommend a few supplements. Uh, I want to talk about three of them. Uh, collagen. So collagen should be uh, the fourth macronutrient in my mind. We have, you know, fat, protein, and carbohydrate. And I think collagen should be a separate category because I think it's, it's a critical component of uh, it's, the, it's collagen in our body, skin, hair, nails, connective tissue, tendons, ligaments, uh, fascia, is all collagen. So the, the most prevalent amount of, of, of protein in our body is of collagen in nature. It's, it's, it's collagenous material. And uh, there's certain collagen peptides that we need to get in order to keep up with the turnover of collagen, and we don't get them in the standard diet today. Until 200 years ago or 100 years ago, you know, we ate all parts of the animal. We ate nose to tail. So you, ate, you, ate, you didn't eat, just eat the choice cuts of meat, the prime rib and the T-bone. But you ate uh, the knuckles and the, and the gristle and the organs. Uh, and if it was chicken or fish, you ate the skin. And if it was, uh, after all of the nether parts of the animal were consumed, you took the carcass and boiled it down and made a stock. Um, and everybody did that. And so we all had access to collagen. Over the years, uh, as that sort of fell by the wayside, at least in the 50s and 60s, your mother, my mother, they took Knox gelatin for their nails. Remember yeah, that? They absolutely. Drank Nox gelatin. Absolutely. And then we had Jello. We had Jello, which was, you know, give it whatever, uh, assign it whatever value you want. It was a source of collagen. It's gelatin. Gelatin, collagen, pretty much the same thing. So kids got collagen in their diet from gelatin. Well, after Jell-O uh, Jell had a little bit of a falling off because of sugar and sweetness and stuff like that, in the last 10 or 15 years, there's no source of collagen in our diet for anybody. And so we're seeing, like among elite uh, athletes, in, in, you know, basketball players who are tearing MCLs, ACLs, and Achilles tendons, and the surgeons will say, geez, I used to be able to like, have to hack through these, these sinewy parts, now they cut like butter. Uh, it's because people don't get enough collagen in their diet. So I'm a huge fan of consuming collagen. I, I take, uh, my company makes a collagen supplement. That's how much I liked the results I got when I started taking collagen. Um, I do anywhere from 15 to 25 grams a day. Um, but you're not telling our listeners to go eat Jell-O. <laughs> look. Um, Somebody's gonna hear this. Crap, crap. Jell-O is, Jell-O is, look, if you're not eating, if you're not eating collagen, in any other source, Jello is a great source. Jello is a good way to get it. So, I'm just saying. Minus the sugar. Well, they make it without. You know, they make yeah, a, yeah, a low yeah. sugar uh, uh, Jello now. All right. So I have to say that. Um, uh, go ahead. How about vitamin D? So vitamin D, um, Steve. Why do they call it a vitamin? It ought to be a hormone. It is a hormone. Uh, but it's it got classified a long time ago, and that's science for you. The science is settled, and it's a vitamin. Um, Vitamin D is probably the most important single vitamin of all of them. And, um, you know, it's an it's, it's integral part of the functioning of cells. It's, uh, um, you know, we, we, uh, our immune system depends f far more on vitamin D than on vitamin C, for instance. Oh, yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, critical component in uh, the uh, body's ability to recognize precancerous conditions and make the repairs to them. Uh, and typically, if we're out in the sun, we have this, again, we have this designed system that says we get 20 minutes of, of, of sun time a day uh, on unprotected skin, and the body takes cholesterol, yep. the much maligned molecule in the skin, converts it to vitamin D, and we're good to go. Most people don't spend time out in the sun. Most people have been scared away from the sun by their dermatologists. Um, people in northern climates who don't have access to sun for most of the year because of where they live, the, like those people should all be taking uh, vitamin D. And um, you, you ask which form, you know, ergocalciferol, colocalciferol, uh, uh, mushroom-based. Um, I like, 
I like a blend of all three of those because some people absorb different versions of it better than others. Um, and you, 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 know, you might have a different opinion on that, but um, I like to have people have, um, if, you're, if you're not getting any sun, like, even, like I'm tan most of the time, but if I'm not in the sun for a couple weeks, I start down on the vitamin D. It's that important to me. I want to have high levels of vitamin D throughout my body. Me too. Yep. Me too. All right. So we've got a couple of Primal Kitchen Plant Paradox compatible products here. Tell me all about Primal Kitchen. So when you clean up your diet, you get rid of the sugars and the, and the industrial seed oils. And again, you get rid of corn oil and canola oil and soybean oil and processed hydrogenated oils and trans fats. Um, and you come down to this list of healthy choices, vegetables, um, eggs, chicken, fish, meat. Um, it could get a little boring unless you figured out a different method of preparation or sauces and dressings and toppings and things to put on these foods to give them variety so that you would eat them and want to consume them on a regular basis. So I've been writing about food for 15, 20 years and I recognize that nobody was making the kind of sauces and dressings and toppings and condiments that I would like to have exist, the kind that you could use with reckless abandon throughout most of our lives well, this is, you know, use mayonnaise sparingly. It tastes great, That's right. but it's bad for you. You know, or uh, as Oprah used to say, well, take your fork and go dip a piece of lettuce and then go show it to the salad dressing and then, you know, and then, and then eat it. Um, or dip your tongue, your, that's right, dip your fork in the salad dressing yep. and then go stab some lettuce. Please, I'm like, uh, you know, I want to have, I want something to taste great and is good for me and the more I put on my food, the better it is. So we launched Primal Kitchen with that exact... Uh, that, that mission statement, which is to make uh, you know, healthful eating exciting and fun again. Uh, and our first product was this Primal Kitchen Mayo, which is made with avocado oil, organic eggs from Cage Free Hands, organic vinegar from non-GMO beets, uh, no sugar. It is, uh, it, and it took off. It's, the, you know, it's been for years, been the biggest selling condiment in all of Whole Foods. Um, and we're now in, I don't know, 20,000 stores throughout the country with this. Uh, and that sort of begat a whole new, we have four flavors of mayonnaise, we have 14 flavors of salad dressing, and the dressings all use avocado oil as, as the only oil in the dressing. Um, and avocado oil is recognized as the highest heart healthy, you know, it's got the most monounsaturate profile of any of the oils that you can get um, typically. Well, so you, you've recently sold this company yes. yep. to a, a big food company. Yes. Um, I take it you're actively involved. Oh yeah, 100%. I'm, that's my face on the label yeah, right there, it. man. There that's is. me. So how, how do you prevent what's happened to other people when big food takes a really good company over? I don't know what you, you, know, what you hear about uh, other companies recently, because it's not happening recently. Recently, what happens is big food goes, wow, these guys are really crushing it. They know what they're doing. We've sort of lost touch with the marketplace. So they bought us because of what we bring to them. And we bring, so, so and by the way, they bought us, and then they're, just, they're like, okay, we're not gonna touch you, go do what you do. So we still have our offices in Oxnard, we still have everybody that was you know, with the company when it got acquired, everybody's going about their business, we still have uh, great R&D sessions. What, what Kraft Heinz has done is given us resources. So we have more distribution, we have uh, a, deeper pockets to sort of do some R&D and stuff. But no, we, are, we will not be changing this at all. And if we do, it's because I say I found a better way, not a compromise. Uh, and, and I think that's, you're gonna see more and more of that, that big food is now acquiring um, the, you know, the, the better, what they call the better for you category mm -hmm. um, with an eye toward, not toward diluting it and making it worse, but an eye toward like learning, like okay, this is clearly where the consumer wants us to go and some of the brands that we have can never get there because they're iconic and we can't change those. So this is the face of the future. That's great to hear. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I have some friends who are, are sat richer but sadder and wiser because <laughs> their products had gotten changed yeah, by big yeah. food. But okay. 
So, uh, that covers a lot. That's really good. And we've, you've dazzled people with your knowledge that uh, I've been thankful enough to hear, hear for years. So, uh, where, uh, as if anybody really needs to know, where can they find... Oh, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, everywhere books are sold. Keto for life. Yeah. And your products are All everywhere yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're uh, you know, we have the Mayo and some of the products are in Costco or in, uh, uh, you know, uh, Target, uh, Whole Foods, Safeway, Kroger, Publix, uh, you know, uh, on down the line, pretty much everywhere now. And uh, Instagram, blogs, where? So I'm Mark Sisson Primal on Instagram. Uh, it's just a fair amount of just uh, shirtless shots of me, so you don't want to go there. Um, then I've got uh, Mark's Daily Apple on Instagram. And uh, um, marksdailyapple.com is the blog. Yeah. It's, we're now in our third. Uh, 13th year, 14th year, uh, and uh, going strong, you know, an, an article every day for 14 years. Um, yeah, and uh, I think that's it. All right. Cool. Great to see you. You too, man. All right, well, we'll see you in the south of France. I, I <laughs> for <take> sure. <laughs> All right, uh, time for an audience question. Janine Jackson on YouTube asks, I am wondering if there is a way to prepare corn that removes the lectins. It is quickly mentioned on one of your videos that the process used to make corn masa may do this. I am hoping to return corn tortillas and grits to my diet. I'd also love to add polenta and plain tortilla chips. I bet you would. Um, there, there's no human need for corn. Uh, corn is one of the most mischievous molecules that you can eat, and quite frankly, if you are gluten sensitive or gluten intolerant, 70% of you will react to the molecules in corn as if it was gluten. So yes, the Indians were smart enough to treat corn with lye to produce hominy. Uh, I can tell you the stories of what happened when corn was introduced to Northern Italy and look up the word Cretan sometime and you'll find out the horrors of introducing corn that was not treated with lye. So, I mean, millet makes a great polenta, makes a great oatmeal, makes a great grits. You don't need corn in your diet. Just stay away from it. That's all. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. Thank you.